All right. Good morning. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and get rolling. If you uh, spoke last class, uh, I do have your rubrics back to give to you. So uh, please come up after class so you can grab them. Uh, grades on all of the celebratory speeches are on Canvas. So I recommend giving those a look. Those are again out of 150 points. So uh, feel free to give that a look. Uh, and we are barely right ahead into the next uh, set of speeches. So we'll be talking a lot today about informative speeches. Uh, it'll be a little bit compressed since we'll be talking about uh, tips for informative speeches, tips for using visual aids, and tips for presenting online uh, today and Friday. Uh, so I recommend, again, continuing to work through the gun textbook since that provides a lot of really useful resources regarding all of those things. Uh, but we will be looking today at an example and looking at a lot of fundamentals of informative speaking and about how we can use visual aids to help you be in the best position possible for those speeches. Okay, so we wrapped up the celebratory speeches last class. Again, I thought that people did a really good job on them. I'm going to talk about some general things that I noticed, some feedback, and some things to work on as you move forward into the next speech. So we'll be looking at some of the nitty gritty of the informative speech assignment. I posted that as well as the speaking schedule on Monday. So we'll be breaking that down together so that you know what to expect and also what to expect from class on those days, since it will be structured just a little bit differently. So um, while you had both verbal and written feedback on the celebratory speeches, I like to kind of give an overall breakdown of general trends, things that I noticed that were present in a lot of speeches uh, that you can continue to use as you're moving forward for the next speech. First of all, I thought that across the board, people did a much better job with pacing and timing, right? A lot of people were in that four to five minute range, which was great. Um, the window uh, for your informative speech is both longer and more generous, right? So you're in that six to eight range uh, for your speaking time. So what I encourage you to do is speak for about seven minutes. Uh, consider how the use of things like visual aids is going to impact your rate of delivery, your pacing, and so forth, right? I think that one thing that I noticed is that people had practiced and through practicing, working through your outline and preparation, um, you generally are able to uh, get in that time range that you need and modify your outline based on the content that you should add or delete. So continue to do that, and that preparation will really help you to make sure that you're getting right in that sweet spot for your speaking time. I also really liked how a lot of these speeches were incorporating those uh, details uh, and information. A lot of Speeches were including quotations. A lot of speeches were including personal stories and examples, right? The use of supporting material is what's making up the meat of your speech. So as you think about the informative speech, which is asking you to integrate outside sources, I think continuing to work on developing that supporting material and using uh, supporting material, it might be statistics, it might be it might be anecdotes, it might be examples, it might be testimony and experience from experts. All of that material helps to bolster and support your main point. And that'll be even more important as we get to the persuasive speeches at the end of the term. Uh, another thing that I thought people did well was working on concluding sentences. I think a lot of speeches had a really good degree of finality to them. It was really clear when the speech ended. And you oftentimes had a note that perhaps connected early on to the speech that really made it clear um, about the significance of the points that you had raised before and where you wanted the audience to go after that. So a few things to work on. Um, so one thing that I thought some speeches can continue to develop is the use of a very clear thesis sentence. 
Um, when you're thinking about the thesis sentence, its goals and its purpose, you should be thinking about the genre and what it is that you're trying to fulfill through a speech. Are you trying to really focus on the moment, right? To share your wisdom and thoughts and feelings that you should have as you prepare for graduation? Should you be sharing um, information, right? I want us to become educated and more aware about this issue, right? So your goal in an informative speech is to educate. So I think having a sentence that sums up the main purpose and goal of your speech is a really important thing to include in your outline because it really helps to guide us as an audience and frame the rest of the speech and the points that you get. I also think uh, some speeches can continue to work on an explicit preview of the body point, right? Tell me what you're going to tell me. In this speech, we'll be looking at the history of the banana as well as its culinary uses, right? That would be a topical organizational style. Uh, today, I'm going to be exploring uh, the Great Depression as it happened and as we remember it currently, right? So providing that type of really clear uh, verbal preview is something to continue to work on in some speeches. There are some previews that are a little bit vague. Uh, we'll be discussing the banana, uh, right? Doesn't really tell me what main points you're covering in the speech, but separating that out into the history and its culinary uses is a way that I can follow along the speech a lot better. One thing to work on is while a lot of speeches included multiple body points effectively, uh, one thing that you might consider is how you're balancing the body points out. There were some speeches where uh, you would have a very large body point that maybe occupied like two or three minutes, but then a, a very short body point that was only about 30 seconds and then you got to your conclusion. One thing that I encourage you to work on is to kind of pace out your body points. They don't need to be exactly the same length or have the exact same amount of content, but try to avoid making them feel too lopsided from each other. There's probably more content you can give to one point, less you can give to another. Uh, try to shoot for somewhere within 30 seconds or so uh, of difference between those points. That just helps us to feel that the points and ideas you're covering in the speech feel consistent with each other. <laughs> and then continue to work on deliberate causes. Right? A lot of speeches used good humor, they used uh, good supporting material, but giving people a chance to take things in Sometimes people aren't going to react right away, right? If you're asking people to raise their hands, uh, don't move on right away. Uh, give them a second to do that. Or one thing I like to do if I'm looking for volunteers for something, I will hold the silence and make it as awkward as possible until somebody saves us by raising their hand, right? Uh, so give people the chance uh, to um, take in a point before you move to the next one. They don't know the speech, uh, but you do. Uh, so people are going to have a little bit more time to try to react, and also people are going to be defaulting to listening, being respectful, and realizing that they need to engage with something is going to take them a split second. So I encourage you to take advantage of that time to really uh, let the audience react to a message. <clears throat> So the informative speech, right? So uh, the informative speeches are happening all of next week and then um, a bit into the following week. And so the big difference and the thing to know about the informative speeches, right, um, is these are the one speeches in the class that rather than giving them face to face uh, are gonna be given over Zoom. And I know that Zoom is not fun. I'm not a big fan of Zoom either, but here's the thing, right? Uh, you have either been in meetings through Zoom, including over the last several years, Zoom meetings that have oftentimes been run poorly, been organized poorly, include poor public speaking and presentation skills, or uh, it is almost certain that in your future, in your career, in your professional life, in your work, and in the responsibilities that you do, you are going to be asked to present in a virtual meeting, right? Um, this is especially true as more and more work goes online or includes an online component, uh, and we're connecting more in that digital capacity, right? It's accelerated under COVID and continued to accelerate. Um, so we know that there are a lot of bad online speakers. And my goal for this class is for you not to be one of them, because I don't think that we do a whole lot of work to examine best practices and what it means to present online effectively. So uh, the informative speeches are going to be delivered through Zoom. What that means is that if you're traveling, uh, if you have other commitments, if this is your only face-to-face -face class for those speaking days, you do not need to be here. Um, instead, you can be wherever you have access to stable internet, uh, camera, and video, right? Um, if you are speaking, I ask that you have video and audio on and working. 
I encourage you to perhaps book at the EOU library or find a space on campus that's able to accommodate that or reach out to me if you're not able to find a space or resources in order to uh, present online in that way. Um, if you are not speaking, right, I'm still asking you to come to class. I'm not going to require you to have your video and audio on for days that you're not speaking. But like before, I will be having uh, a peer review that you'll be turning in for attendance. Uh, but rather than turning that in face to face, you'll be emailing me that. So you don't have to have video and audio on, but you will be asked to complete a peer review form uh, and email that rather than physically handing that in. That also means that uh, rather than uh, give me a face-to-face -face outline, uh, you can email me your outline before you start your speech uh, for this one, right? So a little bit different um, and um, happening over Zoom. So um, your goal here is to pick a topic that's interesting to you that you would like to inform and educate us about. I've seen a lot of really interesting informative speeches over the years. Um, had one that I was watching last spring that involved uh, teaching us how to lasso, right? A kind of demonstration style speech was really cool. Uh, I've had uh, people who are giving informative speeches talking about their own culture, their background, their lived experiences, and using uh, background and culture as a way of framing the speech and talking about supporting content. Um, I've had speeches that have educated us about a significant event, right? So there are a lot of different things that you can draw from. I encourage you to think about an issue that you're interested in, that you're invested in, or that you'd like to learn more about uh, to share to the class, right? In addition, uh, I am going to be asking you to use uh, visual aids, right? So uh, one of the easiest ways that you can do that, and one thing that will be enabled for your informative speech, is screen sharing. Um, now, here's what I don't want you to do, right? I do not want you to only include text-based slides as your visual aid, right? Because that's not really a visual aid. It's an accompan accompaniment, right? It helps to highlight your points. But when you're thinking about a visual aid, you might think about visually displaying something like a graph, uh, a statistic. You might show an image of a location or topic. You might even show a very short video clip, maybe 30 to 45 seconds. You don't want that to become the bulk of your speech, right? Uh, so integrating content that's engaged, that's not simply using text. Another thing that you can do is you can do a show and tell, right? You can visually show us something with your camera uh, that is uh, in the frame for your speech, right? So you have a lot of different options that you can draw from here, but I am asking you to include at least some type of visual aid in order to support your speech. Another thing that I recommend that you do um, is because we're all subscribed to Zoom, you have the option to create a Zoom test room. And if you log into your Zoom account, it's really easy to practice using screen sharing or to practice uh, messing with the camera uh, and doing that in a way that helps you to prepare. If there are specific things that you'd like me to do that can accommodate you, let me know at least the day before your speech, and I'd be happy to make any adjustments or help you with uh, any material that you'd like to see included, right? I'm not going to share a screen for you, but I can help you if there are specific settings that you want to make sure are activated or changed uh, in order to accommodate your speech. So um, I um, wanted to let you know about those expectations, six to eight minutes. Uh, the outline will be longer, right? Include at least three outside sources. This is longer speech. Um, you should be citing and drawing from sources if you're not citing from your personal experience or citing from information that's broadly known, right? So using that supporting material and filling in those outside sources is generally pretty easy, right? When it comes to outside sources, don't use Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a great starting point, but because Wikipedia can be edited, changed, modified, and so on, it's not a staple source to use. I recommend instead looking at the links and references that Wikipedia pages bring uh, so that you can include information and supporting content uh, that comes from more credible and reliable sources. So as you're looking, right, you'll notice that uh, the guidelines and rubric for the informative speech are right here. Um, so this is uh, fairly similar, although there are a few changes to how this is graded, right, the outline does need to include those outside sources. You should include in-text and work cited uh, as you did if you included outside sources in your celebratory speech. 
Um, using that supporting content material in the body of your speech is important. Uh, clear organization, just like last time. Delivery, again, is using a combination of video and audio. We'll spend more time on Friday talking about ways to present online effectively. Uh, but um, I am asking you to practice, to come in, um, being able to use that video and audio effectively. And then the use of visual aids is also present in this speech and is one of the things that I'll be looking at here too, right? Uh, visual aids that enhance the key ideas of the speech rather than just using text, using things like images, statistics, reports, a live presentation of material, maybe even, even a very short video as a way that can help us to uh, add that content into your speech. So that's a total of 250 points again, continues to build off of the things that we've been doing so far. The speech schedule, I made a couple changes to the speech schedule for folks who sent along their availability. So I recommend double checking that. If you have a conflict and you know you cannot make that speech day, please email me right after class and we can talk about that. Uh, but we have Annika, Cade, Devin, Skylar, and Ferris scheduled for next Monday. CJ, Noah, Olivia, Chad, and Jessica scheduled for Wednesday, the 22nd of February. Tucker, Lily, Mary, Austin, and Kelly scheduled for Friday, February 24th. Natanya, Lizzie, Audrey, Kenzie, and Natalie scheduled for Monday, the 27th. And Alofa, Michaela, Chris, Ella, and Alexander scheduled for Wednesday, March 1st. Um, so that's only five speakers each day since the speeches are longer. Um, again, let me know if you anticipate a conflict. Otherwise, uh, you should plan to join us uh, on that day. should also add the Zoom link to join us online for those speaking, speaking days. It's the same Zoom link for all of those days. Zoom link to class on an informative speech day is right here on the front page. Um, I'll also send that out as an announcement before we get into those speeches next week. So same link for all of those class meetings should have screen sharing and all of those features enabled so that you can do that during your speech. Um, and that's what we'll have as we get into next week. Any questions about the informative speech, the guidelines, expectations, or anything else? Yes, Chris. You have to have visuals like on the screen sharing or can you have like a separate computer behind you, like a separate screen? So either, right? Uh, if you're doing a separate screen on your computer, right, and you're showing that to us, I think the trick is just to make sure that that's really clear and visually seen. Another option that people can do that can work as a visual aid if they don't want to screen share is if you print something out and then you kind of show us that at the front of the camera, it can also be a way to incorporate that material. So yeah, good question. Does not need to be a screen share, but that is definitely one of the ways that you could include a visual aid. Another thing, uh, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but um, I encourage you to only include and show us the visual aid as long as it's relevant. If you have a speech that's like six minutes long and you have like an image as a part of your speech, right? You might screen share and show us the image, uh, but if you let it linger for the entirety of the speech, it starts to become a distraction. Show us the visual aid for as long as it's relevant. And when you're no longer speaking to or alluding to the visual aid, take it down, right? So I encourage you to think about how you're including that. Any other questions? Great. If they do come up, let me know. And again, if you anticipate a conflict uh, on that day, let me know. Uh, we'll be talking today about some of the best practices and things to do for effective informative speeches. So informative speaking is one of those three big genres. We talked about salvatory, which you all did in those different prompts last time. We'll talk about informative speaking. And then the last one that we'll be getting into at the end of the term is persuasive speaking. So I think one of the things that differentiates informative from other styles and genres is that your goal is not to convince us about something. Your goal is not to focus on the moment. Think about yourself as a reporter, right? Telling us what's going on. Like there's a major hurricane. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are going down, right? Or your teacher, right? Who's educating and has a goal of getting us to a point cognitively where we can understand and better engage with something. It's to make us aware and knowledgeable about something that you know about, right? So that might draw from your personal experience or it might be through the process of research and preparation that you've done. In other words, you're showing us what you know, right? And um, one challenge, right, is to avoid 
sharing material that's common knowledge, right? The goal of an informative speech is to educate something in class of college students, right? Um, that not a lot of us might know how to do, uh, or an issue that we don't have a whole lot of attention dedicated to, right? So I encourage you to dig a little bit into a topic that's interesting, right? If you were giving a very general speech about World War II, that would not necessarily be a good choice because that's a general topic that a lot of us know about, hopefully. Uh, but if you were getting into the experiences specifically of a population of people who were impacted, or maybe even drawing from your own family and how your ancestral background was impacted by World War II, you might choose to speak to that a bit more, right? So I encourage you to dig a little bit deeper if you have a very general topic. I wanted to share an example informative speech that I think uh, does a great job here of highlighting many of the key points of effective informative speaking and also the integration of visual aids. This was a national informative speaking uh, finalist and champion, uh, and I think does a great job of showing us a lot of these components of effective informative speaking. So I'll share that uh, once this ad finishes up, uh, but we should be thinking about how we're able to speak to our own experiences, our background, or our research as a way of letting us become more aware and educated about an issue. Informative speaking, right, is generally easier in some ways than something like a persuasive speech because it's easier to make us aware rather than change the point of view. Uh, I like to use the metaphor, um, if you're familiar with the story, right, of the sun and the wind, um, there's somebody who has a coat on, the sun and the wind are debating how they can get the person's coat off. Uh, the wind tries to blow really hard, right? And the person just zips up their coat. The sun kind of shines, it goes out there, and then the person chooses to take off their coat themselves, right? So the sun wins because rather than pushing us really hard, right, it's there, it's educating, it's informing, right? That's what an informative speech does. It might have a goal, uh, but education is the ultimate purpose that empowers the audience to unzip the coat. It tries to be objective, right? It tries to present facts and material, although we wanna think about source credibility. Where did this come from? Uh, who wrote it? Who paid for it? Because those factors can impact uh, the points that are raised in the speech too. And um, there's a greater burden that the information that we give, right? You're asked to give this speech, you're asked to present and give us your uh, information and we're using the time uh, to listen to you. It needs to be material that's relevant, that's important, uh, that connects to the audience in some meaningful way, right? That gets us to care. Okay. So I wanna share this video example that I think does a great job of highlighting both uh, some of the effective elements of public speaking in uh, an informative context. Let's talk a little bit. What are your parents talking about when tell you this story where you heard it in school? The story of the birds and the bees. There was a bird. While it's important for parents to have this discussion with their children, there is another talk that is discussed as often. I received this talk at the New York Hotel after using the documentary shampoo. The outside of the bottle read shampoo. But what it should have said was white people shampoo. That night, my mom explained to me the differences between black and white hair. But it seems my Caucasian friends have never received this talk. And this has led to some pretty awkward impact. Black women's hair has long been the subject of intense scrutiny and offensive comments. If we truly want to mend racial tensions in this country, we must start at the root of the issue. So today, let's have a little talk. I like to call the group and I look to the black hair on the Then discussing the history of black hair before finally examining its effect on our youth and youth. 
So let's try this. This seems to be a very hair subject. Don't think it's about time we call it Becky with a good hair. To get our class started today, a relaxer, a process where tightly coiled strands are chemically relaxed to create a straight hair style. A hot comb, similar to a flat iron, straightens your hair while combing out for the one wet. Braids. Our hair can be braided with or without extensions. Hair braided with extensions can take up to eight hours. We cut people. This could be a different of the hair that you bought to the hair that you already own. And to save you some trouble, don't ever ask your black friend, is that your real hair? After spending hundreds to thousands of dollars on her hair, of course it turns. She bought it. Dress. Tightly coiled strands that hang down. Let this all in. Yes, dress are clean, and wearing them does not mean you smell, sell, or smoke marijuana. You may see your black friend put on a funny looking hat when she comes to sleep over. A satin cap. It's used to maintain these hairstyles and many others that she has worked for hours to achieve. And your cotton pillowcase will definitely pick it up. The misindication of black hair has left many myths and misunderstandings. This has sparked a recent movement called You Can Touch My Hair, where African American women allow passers by to touch their hair and answer questions in order to diffuse misconceptions. But they have concluded that once people take the opportunity to touch black hair, they realize that they're not a lot like ours. And apparently, it's a lot more than just African American women who are taking part in this one thing. The hypothetical composition of Afro Texas hair is identical to Caucasian Texas hair. The morphological difference is its elasticity and comfortability, which requires Afro Texas hair to have a technique. This explains why I can use that good help. Because my cuticle doesn't like flat, to my curly Texas hair. My hair requires a shampoo that contains more oil in order to successfully use my scalp. I think this is the hair she did. Long and sheep. Plants with an oil substance that lubricates our hair follicles. Water steam works hand in hand to moisturize our hair. However, when water and sebum are not able to drive directly down our hair shell, it leads to dry hair. Hair, so now we need a straight path for water and sebum to dry down. Now the effects of hair lacks moisture, which is why black women don't wash their hair every night. This has nothing to do with cleanliness, and it's not nasty. When you wash your hair, remember the tracking oils from your hair fall. And since African American textured hair lacks moisture, washing your hair every night can be harmful. This is why, according to the Headlight Center, only 0.3% of African American students in school get black, compared to 10.4% of whites. Who's nasty now? Due to the products that African American have in their hair. It's more difficult for whites to attach to our hair folds. But there is a lot more than oil that stripped from the ends of black hair. There's a lot of history tangled with our roots as well. It is estimated that over 11,640,000 African left the continent between the 16th and 20th century due to the sand of enslavement. When Africans were brought to the new, they were forced to accommodate European standards, which meant straight hair. As the highest standard of beauty, and in an attempt to blend into certain society, Africans took extreme measures to achieve these silky strands. In 1905, Madam C.J. Walker created a line of hair products called the Walker Fix, consisting of iron combs, known today as the hot combs, relaxers, and other types of lotion. These products were used specifically to straighten black hair, which led Madam C.J. Walker to become the first female millionaire in the United States. So African Americans wore their hair 
What I didn't tell Angela did is what the status quo is for beautiful black hospitals. What hospital is the one? The African Americans should run their hospitals. The top society standards of with their acceptance and work. But unfortunately, where care styles such as Angela Davis have left many discussions in our society that things are being taught to where they're have strength, to land a job, a promotion, or to even be accepted. If the university, a historically black university, Place the ban on dreadlocks and cornrows in their classrooms in 2001. Despite the outrage from the African American community, this ban was successful in earning students jobs in corporate America. But this doesn't start in college. Elementary school students have been suspended from school for hairstyles that, quote, distract from the learning process. When we ban such hairstyles, we fail to see the underlying impact of our youth. For example, Melissa Harris Perry, former talk show host of MSNBC, who wore her hair in braids, received an email from a viewer about her daughter. Her daughter watched the show not because she wanted to see movies, but she was excited to see someone who looked like her on national television. The viewer later stated that watching Melissa Harris Perry's talk show kept her daughter's dream of becoming a model. A lot. The lasting impression was beautiful, smart, and accomplished black women to wear their hair braids too. Or meet five year old Jacob Philadelphia. When he met President Obama, he asked such a day because he wanted to know if his president's hair looked and felt like his own. These things sound like two simple stories. But in Melinda Harris case, the beauty of the little black woman who could never see himself as a little bit of country, the beauty of the little black girl that has grown up in a society that hopes his little girls, which is Beyonce's daughter, Blue Ivy, to wear their natural. If you have no girl to pull explaining why her hair comes up like that, or if you can ask if that's your real hair, if you that person, the physical embodiment of the president and the first lady has, the hair of the president and the first lady has. And hair is ultimately what holds the black community together. And it's been done to over years. Men and women spend hours in hair salons and barber shops. Not just to get their hair done. Historically, barbers have been leaders within the black community. Joyce Ball a psychiatric epidemiologist and health educator, writes that the role of the black barber shop within the black community has been a safe place for African Americans to gather, create strategies, and promote unity within their communities. Barber shops are places of learning. For African Americans during our country's most oppressive time. They were an essential part of the Black community then, and they continue to be today. I mean, are we going to say that these barbershops are a part of our heritage? Black hair is in all, and it should be embraced like any other person. What conversations we have about Black hair? The Black these misconceptions are just big. So just like they told me the story of the birds and the bees, it's the same for the birds and the bees. The more you know, the safer will be. But it's not what's on your head that defines you. It's what's with it. Thank you. So um, this is a much longer speech incorporated a lot more visual aids than you need, right? But I do think that it includes a lot of tenets and components of informative speaking that you can consider and apply and use yourself, right? Uh, so one thing uh, that you noticed here is that 
There are some points that are made that are more persuasive in nature. Some of the comments regarding uh, sort of general statements about society, about society's treatment of black women, of care, right, have been um, given. But the main focus, right, is about educating and making us aware about the topic. Uh, of hair and how for many African Americans, right, the way that the hair is textured, designed, and so on is very different and has a different set of needs, such as uh, shampoo, hair care, and so forth, um, while also trying to educate us about history, context, application, and so on. So there's good kind of organization of different topics and issues, whether we're getting into the kind of nitty gritty about that hair and how that hair is working uh, versus the history, the context, and some of the other issues, right? Um, another thing that you noticed is some of the variation in the types of visual aids used, right? You don't need this dynamic, uh, like blackboard easel that's uh, revealing a lot of these different pieces. Uh, but one of the things you noticed was the inclusion of the wig, the inclusion of the receipt, uh, the inclusion of a visual that complemented and supported the speech, right? When she's talking about some of the textures and the way the hair follicles are structured, including a visual that shows us the weightiness of the hair follicles was a really good way to visually show us what's going on and help us better understand the topic, right? Uh, providing a thesis about education Drawing from Jordan's own experience uh, and using that supporting material uh, is a way that you can incorporate those components, right? Uh, one thing to think about here is source and source credibility, right? A lot of the sources, uh, some of that personal testimony, the use of, uh, for example, psychiatric uh, experts talking about some of the impacts and health, I thought were good. Uh, when you're looking at sources though, right? A lot of the sources that were included do come from political bias. So that is going to impact uh, the persuasiveness and the credibility of the messages. So I think it's important for us to take a minute and to do what we can to present uh, as neutral as possible of sources in that instance, right? Because one uh, potential downfall of a speech like this one is when you're flagging sources that have more uh, social or political bent, um, unless there's a specific context that makes that source inclusion relevant, that can also alienate uh, viewers too, right? So I think this speech does a good job of highlighting some of the key ideas here. Focus on education, the focus on using visual aids, uh, and a thesis that perhaps has a social, cultural, or political goal through its in information, right? But it's not a speech saying um, we need to do X, Y, Z with regard to hair, right? We're not saying that we need to restock or change shampoo that's available at hotels to make us aware about those issues such that perhaps we might develop our own ideas of what we should do about it, right? So that's the fine line that informative speeches are oftentimes trying to walk. So when it comes to informative speeches, there are a few different types that we can consider. Um, and you can think about these as ideas for kinds of informative speeches that you might give for this class. One of them is an object, right? So you might give an informative speech about a thing. Uh, for example, about the Empire State Building. You might choose to focus on that for your speech, or you might have something that you wanna show us and talk to us about. The object should be interesting, should be relevant. Uh, perhaps you're talking to us about the history of the pencil, right? Or everything that goes into the pencil, where the rubber comes from, where the metal comes from, where the wood comes from, because it's sourced from so many different countries and locations. Um, we should know things about the object that we don't already know by listening to your speech. We are learning uh, about this object, particularly if it's an object we use all the time, but we don't really think about much. So if you're involved, for example, in woodworking, construction, or in a field that interacts with an object that might be a really good example of one that you could use in your speech. People, right? So you might give a speech about a figure or person that's significant. Uh, if this is a person in your own life, you might check in with them ahead of time for permission, or you might situate and explain their relevance to the audience, right? Um, so you might give a speech about the famous Yogi Berra, uh, but avoid a Wikipedia summary. Again, Wikipedia is a good starting place, but should not be one of the sources that you use in your speech. Events, right? Talking about events, uh, things that have happened, like the Great Depression, that's another type of speech that you could give, right? Uh, events, again, should be interesting, they should be relevant, uh, and they should provide some of the nitty gritty that goes beyond a basic description that everybody knows. So one thing that can be used in informative speeches is to demonstrate or show us something, talking through a process. Uh, so the extent to which you want to demonstrate is up to you. Uh, but, for example, 
I'm going to teach you how to cook an egg. You might show us the steps in some of the different ways that you might cook an egg, sunny side up, scrambled, over easy, et cetera. Um, and you can walk us through that process. I'm gonna tell you uh, the way that you might build a tree house, right? Showing us and explaining those steps is how you could use a process-oriented informative speech. The concept, right? Perhaps you're telling us about the concept of Schrodinger's cat, the cat that is both dead and alive at the same time. Right, which is a more theoretical, uh, science-oriented concept. Um, generally speaking, um, these concept-oriented speeches are about these general ideas, but it's about making them relevant to the audience. Right. So why should we care about the theory of relativity? Maybe you're explaining why uh, that's important to our lives. And then an issue. Right. So uh, in the case of this speech, right. Uh, the topic of black hair in the United States was framed as an issue, right? It was framed as a, an important uh, topic uh, that has a dispute, disagreement, and discourse, right? Uh, so rather than tell us a particular take on that topic, you're letting us know about the topic and providing a survey of the thoughts or issues. One example here is that in recent uh, elections at both the state and federal level, right, more states have been taking on mail-in ballots, uh, early voting, and uh, in that process, there's been uh, dispute and disagreement over ballots that have not included the uh, folder that's designed to um, protect and anonymize the ballot, right? So how do we count naked ballots has been an issue of controversy uh, in political discussion and recounts and so forth. You might, rather than say, here's what we should do about these ballots, present the different sides of the issue and the way that people have been talking about that topic. In addition to these types, there's also strategies that you get to utilize in your speech. You can describe something, right? Using sights, sounds, smells, uh, and things that help us to visualize this issue, right? So helping us to visualize uh, hair, uh, many African-Americans, right? Using uh, that diagram was a way to provide a description here, showing us the curls, follicles, uh, the oil uh, and dryness of hair uh, was a way to descriptively engage. A definition, right, is explaining the concept, right? So Schrodinger's contradict, a cat is a contradiction. The cat's both alive and dead. Uh, a definition can be a dictionary definition. You might draw from a dictionary source there. Um, it can also be how the meaning has developed of a term. Uh, for instance, uh, the term gay, right, has a lot of different connotation over the last several decades. Uh, you might give an example of the thing. So you might show us uh, how relativity is at play, like two people are driving in a car, or you might show us how something is working, showing us how to make a sunny side up egg and saying, this is a sunny side up egg. An explanation, right, provides context, shows us what happened. Uh, here's why the Empire State Building was created. That'd be an example there. A demonstration, as mentioned, is showing us the different steps and parts, uh, showing us how an egg gets made. And the narration, right, is providing a verbal explanation of what happened. Uh, so you might provide a history-based or context-based description of the issue. Uh, in Jordan's case, right, she was talking through uh, some of the folks, uh, such as Angela Davis, who have shaped a lot of cultural and political discussions surrounding hair. So when it comes to informative speeches, right, keeping it simple, unique, and personally relevant is important. We're not going to know all the depth, the jargon, the terminology over the course of six to eight minutes. We only remember so little, right? So keeping it focused to the things that you really want somebody to take away and situating your own experience, your relevance, and your background to the topic is useful here, right? Uh, the KISS rule, keep it simple students, I think is a fun way of thinking about that. Breaking it down to its important components that help us to better grasp an issue. So what I'd like you to do is to take some time here for brainstorming. Um, so for your attendance today, I'd like you to think about two to three ideas for informative speeches that immediately come to mind. You're not married to these ideas. This is just the starting point. As you're developing these ideas, I want you to be thinking about uh, what types of informative speeches um, that we've talked about here, objects, people, processes, concepts, and issues your ideas fall into, and what strategies among description, definition, explanation, demonstration, or narration 
could be used in order to support the speech. Yeah, what's up, Alex? <laughs> Email is fine if you're typing this out. It says part one, but we'll have this be your full attendance for the day, and we'll do part two on Friday. Give you a couple more minutes here. You're not married to these ideas. In fact, there's a good chance you'll come up with more ideas later that um, we can talk about a little bit. By the way, I'm also happy to chat with you about your ideas. If you have tentative ideas that you're interested in and you're not totally sure um, if it's a good one, or you're trying to pick between a few different ideas, let me know and I'm happy to provide some feedback about what might be a good idea to pursue for your speech.
So we spoke a bit to the inclusion of visual aids uh, today, but we'll be talking more about some of the best practices for visual aids as well as presenting online on Friday. Um, so um, to wrap up some of the key ideas for today, We talked about how the informative speeches begin next week and shoot me an email if you know that you have a conflict so that we can reschedule you. Otherwise, you should plan to present on that day. Uh, again, I shuffled the days people are speaking given some of the uh, times that you were speaking before. Talked about the informative genre. It's focused on education and an example of an informative speech. You also talked about visual aids and some of the ways that you can incorporate those in order to enhance your speech too. So be thinking about the idea that you want to explore for an informative speech over the next few days. Next class, we'll talk about speaking online, uh, presenting and incorporating that visual material online to bolster your points. So uh, if you haven't done so already, please email me or pass forward your attendance activity for the day. Have a great rest of your morning and I will see you again on Friday.